there's a story in the Talmud that goes like this. When Adam saw that the day was progressively diminishing, he said, woe is me. Perhaps because I sinned, the world is becoming dark around me and will ultimately return to the primordial state of chaos and disorder. And this is the death that was sentenced upon me from heaven, as it is written, and to dust you shall return. He arose and spent eight days in fasting and in prayer. Once he saw that the month of Tevet had arrived and saw that the day was progressively lengthening after the solstice, he said, ah, this is the order of the world. He went and observed a festival for eight days. The next year, he observed both these eight days on which he had fasted the previous year and these eight days of celebration as days of festivities. Imagine Adam, the first human being on earth, noticing the days getting shorter and shorter, the nights getting longer and longer. It feels like the end of the world. And so he assumes that it is, in fact, God unmaking creation, maybe because of something Adam has done. So he fasts and prays for eight days, perhaps hoping to avert the destruction, perhaps just mourning the death of the world. But then the winter solstice arrives, and Adam sees that the days are getting longer again. He sighs with relief and says, oh, this is just the way the world works. And so he celebrates for eight days. And the next year, he celebrates for 16 days, turning the first eight days of mourning into days of celebration, in addition to the second set of eight days. This Midrash is an origin story for the ancient Roman holidays of Saturnalia and Kalenda, which as the rabbis tell it, Adam instituted for the sake of heaven and only later did the Gentiles establish them for the sake of idol worship. The rabbis like the Romans and other ancient peoples understood that the winter solstice, the darkest time of the year was a time of fear and death and despair. And so from the very beginnings of human history, it has been necessary to find reasons to celebrate, to make extra life and light, to dispel the darkness in the world. But I think Adam's story teaches us another important lesson as well. When he feels like the world is about to end, he mourns. He doesn't deny the reality of his circumstances or what he thinks is the reality of his circumstances. He doesn't pretend that the world isn't ending. He doesn't throw a party. He faces the end of his own life and the destruction of the world, and he grieves. Through fasting and prayer, Adam gives voice to his suffering. The story doesn't tell us what he says in those prayers, but I think that during those eight days of mourning, Adam was speaking words of lament. Here's how the theologian Rachel Adler describes lament. How can the broken re-enter the realm of language and speak the unspeakable? The doorway I would maintain is lament. In lament, the boundary between the made and unmade universe is thinnest, for it is the cultural form closest to the pre-verbal howl of pain. Lament can be incoherent and chaotic picking its way through a broken rubble of unbearably vivid happenings and intolerable sensations. Its content is dangerously dark and disordered, and its meaning may be non-existent, rejected, or found wanting. And yet I want to argue that the doorway through which lament enters the world is a petach tikva, a doorway of hope. As Dr. Adler argues, Lament is what allows a person who has become, been in the throes of trauma, a time of chaos and incoherence, to re-enter the world of meaning. So when the crisis is averted and the world doesn't end, Adam is able to truly celebrate precisely because first he lamented. He bore witness to the darkness and expressed his fear and sadness in the face of it. As we approach the darkest night of what has been a very dark year, I wanna say this. 
it is okay not to feel joyful, even during this so-called holiday season. It is even okay to feel sorry for ourselves, whether it is because we can't go on vacation or we can't see our loved ones or because we are lonely or afraid or grieving. 300,000 Americans and 1.66 million people have died from this disease. It is entirely reasonable to be heartbroken. Now at this moment, maybe some of you are thinking, wow, Rabbi Sarah, thanks for the uplifting message on this Shabbat. And it's true. Shabbat is supposed to be a day of joy and peace and forgetting the world's troubles for a while. So if you're able to achieve that, please enjoy your Shabbat. And please tell the rest of us your secret. If you're not able to find much joy even on this Shabbat, then you might appreciate another story, this one from the Jerusalem Talmud. The great sage Rabbi Akiva had lost his son Eliezer. Rabbi Akiva's students encountered their master crying on Shabbat. They asked him, Rabbi, have you not taught us the verse from Isaiah, and you shall call Shabbat a delight? Rabbi Akiva responded, this crying is my delight. For Rabbi Akiva, who was mourning the loss of his son, crying was cathartic, healing. And so it was a kosher way to observe Shabbat. As the medieval commentator Moshe Israelis writes, and so with one who finds delight in weeping, in order that their pain will leave their heart, such a person is permitted to weep on Shabbat. You might think it's our job to put on a happy face or a brave face for the sake of our spouse or children or friends or just our own sense of pride. But if Rebbe Akiva and Rachel Adler are right, it is only when we express our fear and pain and loss that we can begin to heal. As Dr. Adler points out, we reform Jews, we want to repair the world, and yet we are reluctant to acknowledge that everything is broken, including ourselves. We need laments to vocalize the pain before we can be comforted. Every human loss is a silencing, a letter of the alphabet of creation effaced, erased, a whole world destroyed. We cannot go on until we can break that silence until we can speak authentically to God out of our wounds. The language of lament allows us to re-articulate the alphabet of creation and restores for us the hope of redemption. As it says in Isaiah, God will destroy death forever. Adonai Elohim will wipe the tears from every face. Raising our voices in lament, being honest about the darkness and sadness of this moment is part of what will bring us through the pain and into comfort, strength, and healing. The Hanukkah candles have been put away and we face the darkness once more. But as the activist and writer Valerie Kaur writes, what if this darkness is not the darkness of the tomb, but the darkness of the womb? After all, since ancient times, the winter solstice has also been associated with rebirth. So even though we're sad or angry or grumpy, let's hunker down for a little while longer. The night will soon grow shorter. The light at the end of the tunnel grows closer. It may still be a long, cold, lonely winter, but here comes the sun. It's going to be all right. Shabbat Shalom. Thanks, Rabbi Weissman. Words of Aleinu Le